Hey, and welcome to futurethinkers.org, a podcast about the evolution of technology, society, and consciousness. I'm Mike Gilliland. And I'm Yuvia Ivanova. If you're new to the show and you want to get a list of our favorite books, popular episodes, and to join our community, go to futurethinkers.org slash start. Hey guys, welcome back to the show. In the next two episodes, our guest is John Verveke, a lecturer in the University of Toronto in the Department of Psychology, Cognitive Science, and Buddhist Psychology. He's the author of the book Zombies in Western Culture, A 21st Century Crisis. John's excellent lecture series called Awakening from the Meaning Crisis was recommended to us by Jordan Greenhall and inspired us to invite him on the show. In this first part of the interview, we talk about the meaning crisis, what it is, how and why it emerged, and what are some of the practices and solutions to deal with it. You can find all the links and show notes from this episode by going to futurethinkers.org slash 98. And the second part of this interview will be available at futurethinkers.org slash 99 once it goes live in about a week or so. Enjoy! Check out our new course in Personal Evolution. Part one is on cultivating sovereignty and is designed to support you in developing more clarity about your direction and purpose in life, making better decisions, and having more agency to live your life on your own terms. Part two is on integrating the shadow and is designed to support you in overcoming nihilism and tapping into an inner source of energy, creativity, and wisdom to make meaningful progress towards actualizing your full potential. To learn more, go to courses.futurethinkers.org. John, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. Thank you for inviting me. Pleasure to be here. So we've been diving into your content quite a lot uh, the last few weeks. Um, there is a lot of it out there. And one thing I'm hoping to do in this conversation is to kind of break down some of the more complex subjects and starting with the meaning crisis, because that's kind of the, the central theme behind everything. So can you uh, do the old explain like I'm five uh, explanation of the meaning crisis, if possible? Sure. So the meaning crisis has sort of two components to it, um, um, a, 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 what you might call a, a scientific, a cognitive scientific examination of sort of perennial problems that human consciousness and cognition falls into, um, and then an investigation of what I call psychotechnologies uh, uh, for addressing those, um, and then a historical analysis of why we don't have a worldview that helps um, point out develop, cultivate, guide, uh, create an ecology of these psychotechnologies to address the perennial problems. So we're sort of bereft of what many cultures have traditionally had in responding to these perennial problems. And so the perennial problems get exacerbated uh, very deeply. In, and, you, and then you, you can see that expressed in um, a lot of what, I, we, what Chris Master Pietro and myself call the symptomology of the meaning crisis, you, you're getting you know increases, especially although worldwide because of the reduction of poverty, suicide is going down. You can see it going up in North America, parts of Europe, going up dramatically amongst young people. Uh, the child suicide rate in the United States has doubled in the last 10 years. Um, so Schnell, uh, Tatiana Schnell has even shown some recent research, which I think is very important. Um, as most people think of this as, you know, you there's sort of uh, cognitive, cultural, structural problems, and then you get sort of, right, uh, depressed, and then the depression drives you into suicide. Now, that, of course, is the case, because the depression can drive you into meaninglessness, but she showed independent, independent of people becoming clinically depressed, meaninglessness itself can drive you uh, to suicide. And that that really vouchsafes uh, and, and sort of verifies, you know, Durkheim's old argument about, you know, anomie and the breakdown of a, of a normative, and, you know, and narrative, and normological structure for your society can really increase suicide. And of course, you have, then you have the increased rates of depression, of anxiety. You have um, uh, increase uh, in, in loneliness and all the deleterious effects. Now, what's interesting is the research also says the opposite, that people who have meaning in life are inoculated against all of, of these things. So the more meaning in life you have, the less chance you will fall into suicide, the less chance that you will experience sort of alienation uh, and loneliness. So you've got all of that happening. Um, you've got the addiction crisis. And I think Mark Lewis's work uh, really goes to show that, uh, uh, that, there are, that our old model that addiction is just 
like a like a disease that you have a chemical inside of you and it compels you to act in a certain way is actually uh, mistaken in in a, a lot of ways and so and mark is mark's a colleague and friend of mine but he's is one of the premier researchers on this and i and i was just at a conference last year where a lot of people are coming to this consensus that we shouldn't see addiction in that sort of disease compulsion model because it doesn't explain the data really well and it's also led to a really ineffective prohibition uh, practice, which is not effective. Instead, what you should see addiction as is what he calls reciprocal narrowing. Your world starts to narrow, and then that reduces your cognitive flexibility, and then that makes your world narrow, your, your sort of the options and possibilities, and then that really makes you, you start to get a sort of a scarcity mentality, and that limits your cognition. And you see what happens, you get this reciprocal narrowing until the world loses its possibilities and you lose its po your possibilities of who and what you can be, right? And that, of course, is again, Right, that happens in its response to. Uh, obviously, there are. Uh, uh, don't misunderstand me. Here. There's huge socioeconomic reasons driving addiction behavior and all that. I'm not denying that. But what I'm what what Mark's work is showing is that there is an important meaning making system that's failing in addiction, and therefore we can see the meaning crisis as contributing and exacerbating uh, uh, to that. You can see what's being called the virtual exodus. Uh, that more and more people, you know, there's books like Reality is Broken and things like that, that people are exiting the real world uh, into the virtual world because the virtual world has what they perceive the real world is lacking. The virtual world has a nomological structure. It's rule bound. The rules are clear. Everything makes sense. There's a narrative structure. I, I'm heroically placed in a story and there's a story for the whole world and everything has a grand purpose and I'm unified in it. And there's a normative structure. I know how to level up and transcend and get better. And so those those three orders are so lacking in our worldview that people get uh, seriously drawn into the virtual world. The virtual world also has um, is addictive because it's a place that's designed to create the flow state which is also contributory to meaning making, meaning in life, and people are generally lacking, uh, you know, the the opportunity, the guidance uh, to cultivate the flow state in their own lives, uh, and 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 there, so what this means is for many people, so people don't realize this: the number of people that have mystical experiences, even awakening experiences, in our culture is much higher than is generally acknowledged by, I guess, the popular media or. Uh, the folk psychology, you know, it, around, it hovers around 40%. Yeah. And the, the, the problem is if people have these and they do not have a framework, if they do not have two things, if they do not have a conceptual framework that tells them how to integrate it into their lives, and if they do not have a set of well-developed psychotechnological skills for dealing with self-deception, these anomalous experiences can really, you know, mess them up and be deleterious. And that's unfortunate because the research shows if they can be properly responded to uh, these mystical experiences. We just ran an experiment in my lab where if you have more mystical experiences, right, the more meaningful you'll find your life. But that is actually significantly improved if you have a religious orientation, not a specific one, just a religious orientation for, you know, incorporating and integrating that into your life. And then the research shows, you know, Gaten and others, Griffith, that people across many measures do get better in their lives objectively. And that's something I'm very interested in. You see that people are trying to take uh, individual meaning, systems of meaning, local systems of meaning, and try to get it to do what religion used to do. Religion used to be a, a comprehensive meta meaning system, right, that connected you in these three orders. And, and you know, sort of grounded any in individual meaning system. And, and I'm not advocating for a return to religion. I'm just trying to explain something, right? And religion was deep in that it, re it, it reached into all the different kinds of knowing. It reached deeper than just our propositional knowing. It reached into our skill knowledge. It reached into our perspectival knowing. It reached into that, 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 that deep participatory knowing in which um, how we model ourselves and how we model the world according to these three orders fit together. So it was, very, it was very deep. It was very comprehensive. It gave you a synoptic integration across many domains of your life. And then within that, you would have individual meaning systems. Here's a legal system, here's a moral system, right? Here's a work system, and then what, uh, here's a political system. And what's happened for historical reasons is that people are trying to take individual systems and they're trying to make them do the work that religion used to do, like a political system, an ideology. You get, you know, or people take a particular commitment to a fantasy world, Star Wars, and they try to blow it up into something that will do this work. 
and they can't do it. Now that shades into things that I think are, are, are also, I wouldn't call them symptoms in the negative sense, but they're responses. You see, of course, the rise of the mindfulness revolution. There's criticisms of that, but nevertheless, there's the mindfulness revolution. There's the psychedelics revolution. There is the authentic discourse revolution. There is the intellectual deep web like you guys revolution, right? Um, there are people out there trying to you know, bring back the, this procedural knowing, like people are trying to integrate, you know, parkour, like Rafe Kelly parkour and ritual and storytelling to give people a much more comprehensive, uh, transformative set of practices. You've got all of these things happening. Um, and I think those are sort of more positive indications that people are deeply, deeply searching. So while the research is very clear that uh, being post-religious is, is increasing to rise and it's rising rapidly, there's also, that doesn't mean, and the research doesn't show that people are not hungry for meaning and trying to find it in, in various ways. So what's, I, I think what's happening is, like I said, people have perennial problems of experiencing absurdity, anxiety, alienation, uh, falling into despair. And at some point we could talk about why that might be the case. They have to deal with self-deception in their life. They have to deal with a need to you know, transcend and, and, and develop. So they're looking, if, if you'll allow me a word, they're looking for wisdom, right? And they, they, don't, have, they, they don't have anywhere to go, all uh, right? They, they've got lots of information, they've got lots of knowledge, but they don't have any sort of clear understanding of what wisdom is, how to cultivate it, um, who can be a, a, a trustworthy guide to it, um, et cetera. And so people are often... Like I said, they either suffer these negative symptoms, they're starting to search in the positive system, uh, but they, many people are sort of stuck in, in a very dangerous place, which is they're sort of autodidactically trying to cobble together a set of responses to this. And sometimes it works. Uh, no, no, but the problem with being an autodidact, of course, is that it really, really um, uh, exacerbates your tendencies towards self-deceptive behavior. And you can sort of echo chamber yourself. And of course, the problem with social media is it just allows that to be greatly accelerated and magnified. And so you can get that can very that autodidactic process can very quickly uh, become twisted. And so that's what I would say we, we are suffering right now. We're suffering sort of for historical reasons. We've lost that worldview attunement. Uh, we have a scientific worldview in which we don't fit into that scientific world. world. We're deeply we're deeply alienated from it. So we lack the three orders in a profound way, the, the ones that people are looking for in video games. We lack wisdom institutions. Uh, we, we lack sort of a comprehensive philosophy, if you'll allow me to broaden that term, of how to, what wisdom is, how to cultivate it. Book, now, again, one of the symptoms, positive symptoms, I guess, of the meaning crisis is the, tr the intense interest, both in the public at large, in wisdom, People are turning, you know, trying to bring back Stoicism, uh, various aspects of Buddhism, and even academically, uh, the study of mindfulness, uh, the study of wisdom. I, I participate in both of these are now really hot and important topics in psychology and, and cognitive science, in neuroscience. Um, people, and, and there's a huge academic interest in altered states of consciousness and how that impacts on cognition and character development. So I argue that you can make good sense of all of this by positing that we're in um, a meaning crisis. And then that meaning crisis puts us into a very profound existential scarcity mode that, uh, that can really limit our ability to respond to the other significant challenges we're facing right now. And then those things reinforce each other. We get a sense of doom that reinforces the meaning crisis because the meaning crisis very much hamstrings us uh, from the, the fundamental transformative creati creativity we're gonna need to respond to the issues that we're facing. It's, I hope that was, I hope that was accessible. Actually, I, I think that was one of the best definitions I've heard you give of this. So it's, that's perfect. Um, it brings the question this. So you, you talked about all of the different potential solutions that people are engaging in now. It seems like one giant buffet. Do you see any kind of one track or like a four course meal that people can go through where there's like something that's working at a higher percentage than, than just kind of a la carte? Um, so, I think I, I think so. I think people who sorry, it's hard to answer this with getting into some of the technicalities. I, I, I think people who are addressing the multiple kinds of knowing, uh, right, even if they're doing it intuitively, 
Um, like if they're if they're doing something that's really getting uh, back into the procedural, perspectival, and participatory forms of knowing, that really tap into uh, a sense of cognition and consciousness as being deeply embodied, uh, deeply embedded, dynamically coupled to the environment, inherently self-organizing, dynamical. And so they're doing a set of practices that you know that might might be training uh, consciousness through mindfulness practices. Uh, training uh, the procedural knowing, the interaction knowing through uh, some kind of movement practice, um, that they're training um, propositional knowing uh, by cultivating skills of improving rationality, where, I, where rationality for me does not simply mean being more logical. Mm -hmm. Rationality means to cultivate uh, systematic, meaning very across many domains of your life, and reliable processes for dealing with self-deception. I think that's much more comprehensive and important than just you know go using good syllogistic reasoning, uh, which I think, while a piece of inferential rationality, first of all, it's only a piece of inferential rationality, not rationality a whole, and it's only a piece of inferential rationality. There's much more you have to do. So you can be very logical and still be, in, in, in very deep senses, terrifically self-deceptive. And I think that is not what the ancient notion of rationality is per se. So, um, so for example, in addition to learning logic, you would you should learn. I mean, this is what Teasdale and other people's research is showing. You should learn how to integrate mindfulness practices with things like CBT practices, where you're doing that much more deep, you know, investigation of your tendency towards cognitive biasing. For example, yes, learn some logic, read about reasoning, but don't just don't just do it monologue either. That's another thing where it's uh, so people need to get into yes, but. Any good reasoning should be set within, you know, a dialogue. How do I dialogue with other people? And can I make the dialogue, right, the joint learning, the joint inquiry, supersede any desire to win or crush? This whole model of rationality is demolishing and debunking. I mean, I am so critical of that. I, it angers me. And it, sometimes that even comes out in some of the videos. And I apologize for that. <laughs> but it angers me because it's such bullying. And it's such bullying that it's actually misrepresenting, seriously misrepresenting uh, the core of what rationality is or should do for us. So I think if people are cultivating rationality very comprehensively, right, and, and that includes the mindfulness stuff, that includes the interactional stuff, when I see people trying to tap into all the kinds of knowing in an integrated way directed comprehensively towards overcoming uh, self-deception and affording people a framework for cultivating and integrating trans fundamental transformations of consciousness, cognition, right, character, and communitas, your ability to commune with others. Right? That's, that's the four course meal I think you're looking for. Mm. There's a really good term for this, the uh, kind of integrating different ways of knowing the world and overcoming self-deception. Uh, Jordan Greenhall calls this cognitive sovereignty. Yes, and Jordan and I are, have entered into a dialogue together. We've, um, we had first a, 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 a really wonderful informal uh, conversation, and then uh, we did one for Rebel Wisdom. It's, it's, uh, it's out and available. Uh, we're gonna have another one, a longer one, a 90 minute one. We're gonna film at the beginning of July. And I'm also hoping to meet with Jordan um, in person a little bit later in July because I'll be at a conference in San Diego and he, he, he's there. Um, so yes, I, I, I and I'm, 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 I'm actually going to um, <clears throat> sort of a, 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 an authentic discourse circling uh, uh, event tonight to try and oh, uh, cool. like I'm, I'm, I'm reading about it and I'm doing some work with Peter Lindbergh on this. Oh, uh, great. <clears throat> yeah, and, and then I'm trying. Peter and I are going together. Uh, and because I want to, I'm, I'm trying to, I want to understand it as a participant obs, uh, obser, uh, observer, uh, but I also want to, I also want to be able to sort of bring some of, I guess, for lack of a better word, the theoretical machinery I have to bear on it and try and develop it. So I'm reading the literature as well as just engaging in the practice. So, um, I, and I, I, and I, I find sort of deeply interesting what Jordan is doing and, 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 and I, I, I've been trying to point out to some people because some people, I, and I, I want to be charitable to my readers because they're coming with sincerity and honesty, but they're saying, like, what, what do you see in this guy? Right? What, he's not saying very much. And I'm trying to say, no, 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 don't pay attention to what he's saying. That's, that's I mean, that's not focal, right? It, it, for, it's how he's saying it. He's trying to, he's trying to, right, he's trying to exemplify a different way 
of, you know, of inhabiting your own consciousness and cognition and then inhabiting communication. And, 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 and you know, and knowing that, and, and, I, and I will say to readers, you know, you'll say, well, I know that. Yes, you know that you should be doing. That's not the same as knowing how yes. to do it yeah, and knowing really what mapping. it's like to do it. Yes, exactly. Right. And so, so I, when I'm when I when I'm talking with Jordan, I mean Jordan wants to talk to me about the the content of my series because he he thinks very highly of it, and I thank him for that. He's he's recommended it very strongly, but right, and we do talk about that content. But I'm also very much interested in in, in like like how he's doing what he's doing and how he sees that as a deep kind of response um, to the meaning crisis, which is clearly what he believes because he's said that to me um, on multiple occasions. So yeah, integrating with him, I think, is something that, well, it's begun and I see it uh, to uh, something that's going to continue. Yeah, I was just going to add that, that this practical aspect of how do we actually do it is very important because, you know, in academia, there might be some uh, ideas about how to kind of how to deal with the meaning crisis, but then putting it into practice is what people really want to know. That's what really changes lives. Yeah. So that 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 speaks towards something that was in some sense the genesis not my personal existential genesis of my work on the meaning crisis but sort of academic genesis um um <clears throat> i had uh, so uh, originally evan thompson was going to teach a course and evan thompson is like a grandfather of the whole you know this what's called 4e or third generation cog sci embodied cognition consciousness and how that possibly integrates with practices from buddhism Right. But he, he couldn't teach the course. So he said, well, ask John to teach it. So I started teaching this course and I, I, I originally I was just going to do, you know, here's some cog sign and here's some boot. And then I realized, no, 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 wait, why are these two coming together so powerfully? Why are there people like Evan? Why are people drawn to this program? And then I thought, ah, what you've got is the cog sign is addressing a lot of historical forces. Like you said, it's giving us the theory. But people are turning to Buddhism because they need to know the transformational practices and they are looking for something that will wed a theoretical response to the history with a set of practices that gives them a personal existential response to it. So exactly, I think that's exactly the case. And and I'm and so that's also a bit of a touchstone for me. I look for communities and groups. One of the one of the great gifts of the video series is I'm coming more and more to contact the people. And I keep saying this, they're putting a sort of real time and real talent into creating ecologies of practices, new psychotechnologies, communities. And one of the things I look for is, do they have that? Are they aware of the historical scientific framework and trying to address it? But are they also trying to create you know, comprehensive sets of transformative practices? And are, they, are, are those two in some important uh, dialogue? And by and large, I, overwhelmingly, that's what I keep seeing, that people are not interested in, right, or at least the groups that, to me, feel like they're getting traction on this, like are, are integrating those two sides together so well. We were, as we were listening through your lectures, um, I think you pointed this out that um, it, it almost seemed like you were going through the history of human development as it related to Ken Wilber spiral dynamics kind of model, like going through the different developmental stages and colors. Although and, you didn't say it explicitly. Yeah, but I was waiting really for you to come out and say me. it specifically. But. <laughs> because I don't know his work. Oh, wow. oh really? I know of it. With... I know of it, and I've read a little bit about it, um, but I haven't read his work in any intensive or extensive manner. I, I, of course, I know about transpersonal psychology, but I know of it for people through people like Michael Washburn, uh, Jorge Ferrer, uh, people like that. Um, and so, uh, so I know of Wilbur in terms of sort of some of their criticisms of Wilbur, but I haven't read uh, Wilbur directly. That's not because I'm avoiding Wilbur or anything. It just hasn't. It's one of those things that just had had not intersected with my personal, you know, intellectual history. That, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, I, I really was waiting for that to come out, like the relationship. I'm, I'm of sorry. Dynamics. I'm sorry. To <laughs> it, well, it's it's well, so cool then, actually because you're then take it as something then take it as something else that's actually more epistemically valuable. There's a convergence between my work and his work then, and that's yeah. even ultimately more important, I would say. Yeah. So. And the convergence, really, as I would describe it, is just the attempting to integrate science, spirituality, and society. Yes, and I, I, that, I mean, from what I've seen uh, about this, and I mean, I'm coming across some of the Wilbur stuff in the work on cultivating the Wii space, because uh, the integral community seems to have been a, a significant 
uh, precursor of this whole movement. So I'm also coming into a contact with it that way. I do not feel confident to speak about it at all is what I'm saying, though. Not at all. I, I'm, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was... So I, I, wa I wanted to bridge into something else I've been noticing lately as it relates to the different levels in spiral dynamics um, that as people go through different transformational experiences, um, they seem to kind of latch on to these new experiences as their new full meaning structure. And then, and then because there are multiple stages to go through, you need to smash every new meaning structure to make room yeah. for the new one. But I, I just find this repeating pattern through the, the call. We do weekly calls with a bunch of people who are going through a set of courses that we've designed. And this is one thing we keep seeing happening in the in some of the calls is people will go through and, and kind of grasp onto some new meaning structure. And then everyone in the group is picking that apart so that they can move on. Um, I wonder if you can comment on that, the, the sort of because of that lack of meaning and the desire to make meaning that people grab onto things prematurely. Yeah, I, I think so. That's that's a general example of, you know, scarcity mentality and all the good work uh, that's being done on scarcity mentality right now. When people when there's scarcity, right, uh, people get they get very rigid. And then when they get any indication of a strategy that will um, alleviate their scarcity, they tend to overvalue it and fixate on it. Um, it's a version of what's called the Einstelling effect. The Einstelling effect is that um, you give people when people get a strategy for solving a problem they'll often stick with that strategy even though a better strategy could be used when newer problems emerge right so they, they oh this worked i'll keep using it and and, and that makes a kind of sense because you know you're trying to be very efficient uh, they sort of lose they, they're sort of the opposite of what kids do in playfulness so when, when kids are first learning something They'll get a strategy that solves the problem. And then what they do, Siegler's work shows us, is they'll introduce all kinds of variations on it. They'll introduce all kinds of variations, and then they put the variations into competition with each other. And then the one that wins the competition sort of evolves forward. And then, right? And so, that, and this is one of the things I talk about in the series. I, you guys aren't far enough in, but I talk about the importance of serious play. Um, and that our culture, our culture doesn't know how to deal with play. We either trivialize it into entertainment and fun, or we say, no, then it must be work that, right? right. So serious play, which of course is, uh, and I mean this in a respectful manner, is what, you know, a lot of religion used to do for us. It's very, very serious play in which let's try various identities. Let's try various uh, different ways of looking at, you know, the worldview and, and let's play with them. You know, of course, religions can also ossify i'm not i'm not saying that but what i'm saying is w when people are in a meaning crisis they and they're in scarcity mentality they will tend to fixate and overvalue on anything that starts to alleviate that and of course that makes a certain kind of sense if they however belong to a community that has inculcated in them a higher order identification with the process of evolving serious play then usually their commitment uh to that can help override and keep them uh, going in some uh, some fundamental fashion. So, for example, when I'm teaching uh, people uh, Tai Chi Chuan, right? One of, the, one of the great things about the form is you'll learn this move and you'll get this move. And, oh, I, I get it now, I get it. And then the next move total, totally, right, has you doing the opposite of what you were doing in that move. And people, ah, right? And at first, and you try to tell them, no, 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 right? That's the process, that process of, you know, having to transition between the moves is is actually what you're after take that i know that feels nasty to you but try and relax try and you know keep the principles going and try and really get into that because that's the long-term growth that the form is going to give you and so when you i think when you have a, a structure that people are committed to and what uh you know what allard would call uh, you know aspirational uh rationality um, her book on aspiration is uh, really good. Uh, uh, Agnes Callard, um, and she talks yeah. about, you know, how do you bring rationality to people trying to become something other than they are? Because yeah. our normal models of decision theory is, here's my values, here's my preferences, what gets me the maximal thing from those? But you can't use that normal model because you're trying to actually change your values and your preferences. So you can't use sort of standard uh, ways of making decisions and reasoning. So you, you have to give people a structure. You have to give them some sense that actually that makes them commit to the rationality of the aspiration. And you have to have somebody that they therefore 
is modeling that they can internalize, that they can trust. And then, of course, that brings with it all kinds of risk, right? That brings with it terrific risk. How do we, how, how do we make sure that people who need to make that commitment so uh, they so they can avoid these two things? They can avoid fixating on a premature meaning system that rather than committing to, I, I argue, in fact, that the, the notion of meaning that I talk about, relevance realization, is perpetually evolving. That it, to try and think of it as ever being finished or finalizable is to is to make a deep category mistake. We can come back to that if you want. But we got we have to help people avoid fixating prematurely. But we also have to protect them from manipulation, mm -hmm. abuse, right, um, exploitation. And so we we've got. And the thing is, again, we don't have traditions and institutions that you know. However imperfectly they off they worked in the past, and I'm not protecting them from criticism. They nevertheless were better than nothing. They, they were much much better, right, than nothing. And so I'm not advocating going back. I'm not nostalgic. I'm not a fundamentalist. But like we got to get some of that functionality back for people. We really seriously do. Have you ever heard of that concept, red pilling? So is this some sort of variation on the matrix where exactly. you take the yeah, sort of take, waking up to re, waking up to reality or something? The true like that? reality, but it, it it always implies like the old reality and the new reality, and you take the pill once and that's it. So I've been looking for a meme that kind of represents the continued waking up uh, further out of that you know the every new reality you find yourself in. And I, we came across that one gray gray pilling in uh, mm -hmm. actually it might have been the the meaning crisis um, medium article by. Peter Lindbergh. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, I think it was Peter Lindbergh that said that, actually. Oh, he was referencing to some somebody else. Right. Okay. But yeah. this concept yeah. of gray pilling, I find, is is like a meme to remind yourself, that I'm not done, I'm not done, onward. Right, right. And and and, and so, um, are you, sorry, I want, I want to make it clear that, you know, uh, Peter's a colleague of mine, he's a for, former student of mine, so I don't want to make it sound like we're just independently converging on things. But yeah, I, I agree with Peter, uh, and, I, uh, and I have arguments um, that I will present in the, especially the second half of the series, but the, the history also demonstrates it, but the second half of the series will give you sort of deeper um, uh, uh, philosophical and scientific arguments as to why you shouldn't understand the project of cultivating wisdom, enhancing meaning in life <clears throat> as to trying to come. And I'm going to use this word. It has a harsh overtone, but the illusions are intended, uh, uh, right? We shouldn't look for a final solution to meaning, right? Mm -hmm. We should not do that. Um, that is a very dangerous misunderstanding of, like, you, the your, your ongoing evolving fittedness to your environment, to yourself, to each other, to the world, is meaning, right? Trying to trying to think of it as something that is your that is evolving or being evolved towards is a mistake. The process itself is the meaning, and so, and like I say, I, I'm just I'm just claiming that now. I've got arguments and evidence for that, and it's it's forthcoming, but. I think there are deep reasons why we have to reconceptualize, and there's many other people doing this. We have to reconceptualize the sacred. We have to stop thinking of it as some supernaturalistic property that essentially inheres permanently in some final object, fixed state, et cetera. We should, we yeah. should instead, I would argue, try to recover that was lost, something that was lost, right? Sort of when, as we've developed it, uh, as Verslewis, Verslewis argues, you know, these sort of totalitarian practices of suppression, of suppressing sort of the Gnostic uh, tendencies in Western culture. I'm not, a, a, I'm not an unbridled fan of the Gnostics. There's deep criticisms there. Mm -hmm. But the, the idea that, no, no, we, we should, we, instead of trying to create an orthodoxy, we should have a, a constantly creative, evolving mythos, right? And that we should think of, right, we should, we should think of sacredness as sort of the inexhaustibleness of in right an inexhaustible source of insight, a, 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 a constantly unfolding ground uh, for our evolution. And so, if we if we can so in that in, in that way, Plato is sacred to me. Not the, because I think oh there's the final truth and it's done and we need nothing more. I don't believe that at all. But what I mean is, I read Plato. He not only informs me, he transforms me. I become a different person. My life changes. And then I go back and read that same Plato, and I see things I didn't see before. 
in Plato. And then it informs and transforms me again. I go out into my life, myself and my situation changes. I come back and I see more in Plato and that just keeps reliably hap happening. And for me, that makes Plato deeply sacred to me. It seems like it's one of those processes that safeguards against self-delusion or self-deception. Yes, I think, I, I think that's it. I think the commitment, I mean, that's what we're losing in our culture. Another way of thinking about the meaning crisis is we're losing the commitment to the process, mm. right? And so the, the commitment to the process of overcoming self-deception and affording self-transcendence in a deep way is being lost. And what is being more and more, and this is Stanovich's work on the irrationality. When people really focus on the products of their cognition and they, they, they don't value or pay attention to the processing, that's the hallmark mm. of irrationality. And think about how this is even, you know, ramifying into our political discourse. We people are losing, it seems, and more and more people are commenting on this. We're losing the commitment to the process of democracy. Mm -hmm. And we're more and more fixated on this end goal of crushing or demolishing all opponents and, and sort of gathering all the marbles. And so and so we're losing, you know, democracy used to be this opponent processing in which the system was designed to be self-correcting. And it's got twisted into this adversarial, no, no, the process isn't what matters. What matters is me winning, debunking, crushing, demolishing you, and then taking all the marbles of attention, right, and, and power and wealth to me. And I think, again, I mean, that's, that's a way, and that's, again, why I think that some of the so-called people who speak on rationality are actually contributing to the problem rather than solving it because they are they are advocating this adversarial debunking demolishing crushing having a final absolute victory model rather than no 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 commit to the process of continually overcoming self-deception continually affording uh, self-transcendence and in democracy really, really commit to uh, <clears throat> being involved in a community that a, a communitarian process of self-correction and so i think a loss of the commitment to the process as opposed to attaching again this isn't this is a this is a misplaced ersatz kind of sacredness you know i'm a republican and the right is always right and you know this is this there's there you know it's inherently essentially good for all time and it's like that model of sacredness i think we, we just got to give it up it, it is just the wrong model this is such Sorry, a that, big... was, that was a bit of a speech no i, I love it I, great. I, 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 very passionately about this this is a big reason we got into Jordan Greenhall and Daniel Smokenberg. Actually, this this idea of sovereignty as a framework for how to uh, how to relate and and talk to others, and we've sovereignty applied it process. in our own yeah as a process, and we've applied it in our own uh, relationship. If we get into an argument about something, we end up spending about you know twenty percent of the time on the subject of the argument, and the remaining eighty on the meta of how we arrived in that argument. You know where where the sovereignty was lost in. And that I think is a form, and this is important again. And I mean, and, and there's again, this is something I'm getting into both in practice and, and developing in theory. This is dialogical rationality. It's interesting because, um, and I have his book, I have to read it, uh, but I bought it for precisely this reason. Dan Sperber actually argues in, his, in The Enigma of, the, of Reason that rationality was always an original, well, sorry, it was originally and should always be grounded in dialogical rationality. That is the primordial form of rationality and that's why again plato uh, is so important to me because plato writes in dialogue you have socrates in dialogue with others and then that gets replaced of course and this is one of those what looks like an innocent change and it has so much ramification it gets replaced by aristotle's treatise right the dialogic form of rationality gets presented gets replaced by the monologic presentation mm -hmm. right of a system right now right. that's there's there, there's value to that in, 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 right, uh, in, in, but we lost something really essential, this dialogical aspect, this dialogical rationality, this dialogical wisdom. It seems like that, that I, I might be using the term wrong, that monolithic kind of structural meaning, you know, the put forward is partially a result of people's desire for concrete meaning and latching on to anything that, that like a rule set almost that they can use as a guidebook for life. Instead of so, being comfortable in the ambiguity and the the, yeah. the process, the process, yeah, yeah. So it's, I mean, it, it's about like a part of it is just this pervasive cognitive bias uh, of uh, of fixating on the product of our cognition 
the product of our communication rather than the process. And, um, and so that's just, that's, that's a perennial problem. So that's an example of a perennial pattern of self-deception that human beings have to continually, and you see it through the mystical traditions. You see it in, you know, the Tao, da, the Tao Te Ching begins with, the way that can be spoken of is not the way. Like, remember, remember, right? Like, like, like so these are, this is a perennial, this is a perennial problem. And, and so I, I think there's that. And then I think, as I said, there's a historical issue of a meaning crisis, which causes meaning scarcity, which means people do latch on to what is quick, fast and looks complete and certain because then it can't be taken away from me. If like, if you are starving, you, you want the quickest, fastest, you know, most securable certain food that you can get. You don't look for the best and you don't get involved in trying to improve your food acquisition. You eat the first thing you come across, right? That is at all edible to you. And so I think that's also uh, those two things are exacerb are interacting and, 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 and exacerbating that, that people will, because it's a perennial problem and because of historical meaning scarcity, they will again latch on that way. So maybe let's talk about solutions. Sure. So obviously, <laughs> contemplative practices is a really excellent solution because the whole point is to observe the process and that's, that's it. You know, you just sit in meditation right. and observe the processes of your own being. So I would, I would, I mean, yes and no. I mean, so let, 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 let me, I, 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 I was, I, I, I want to respond respectfully, but I, I, I want to expand my answer. I don't want to simply agree because I think it might be misleading. Mm. And this will come up later on in the series when you uh, get to the episodes on sort of uh, uh, Siddhartha Gautama and, and mindfulness. Uh, because I actually have, I mean, I, I was, I think the first person at the University of Toronto to, do, to teach academically about mindfulness. And I also was one of the first people to uh, extracurricular offer uh, meditation and contemplation and Tai Chi Chuan classes to students. Um, so I, I want, I'm saying that not, oh, I'm saying I'm committed to this, right? But the scientific work has also led me to be very critical, both of quite a bit of the academic work on mindfulness and, and the, the, the Western culture uh, the way the Western culture, ha I think, has has adopted, appropriated, I don't know what word you want to use, mindfulness in a really reduced, uh, re significantly mal malformed fa fashion. So we tend to equate all of mindfulness with meditation, uh, which is, is a mistake. First of all, the Eightfold Path, for example, is in a whole ecology of practices. And, and, and by the way, and I have it on my arm, you know, meditation. It, Right meditation is in the Eightfold Path, which implies there is what? Wrong meditation. There's, right? You have to be careful, right? You're right. The Buddha was very critical of people who just, mend who just meditate and become indolent, right? And, and now, what, 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 why is all of that? Well, uh, what you want, what, we've, what, we, what we need, let me try and at least, I, this is an analogy I use quite frequently. You said step back and look. So we have a bunch of practices that do, here's my mental framing of the world. Right. And so I'm normally looking through that frame where I mean both beyond and by means of. And what I do in meditation is I train myself to do this. I train myself to look, step back and look at it. Right. Because and why do I do that with my glasses? Because there might be gunk on it. But how do I know that I've actually removed the gunk? Not by continuing to stare at my glasses. You know what I have to do? I have to put my glasses on and see if I see the world differently. Right. And so uh, the, the, the work that I did, I published. Uh, two, a couple of years ago with Leo Ferraro, we talked about meditation is this practice for stepping back, right? But contemplation, we should reserve that term for practices that direct us outward. And, and that's exactly what the word contemplation originally means. It comes, it's related to the Latin word for temple, which originally meant the part of the sky you look up to. And it's a translation of the Greek word theoria, where we get the word theory from, which is to see the deeper patterns of reality. Mm. So you have contemplative practices like meta, or, or, or looking at the three marks of existence, or in Stoicism, the view from above. These are all practices that are designed to say, can you see the world differently now? Can you see into the depths of reality, right? And you need contemplative practices because if you're gonna overcome self-deception, you have to do two things. You have to not only break the inappropriate frame, remember the people who are Einstelling, they're fixating, you have to break the fixation, but you also have to be able to see 
a new a new how yes but now how do i see things differently how do i look at the world differently you need an ecology of practices and in addition to you know seated practices of meditation and contemplation you need moving practices you need practices where you're bringing mindfulness into your sensory sensory motor interaction with the world in an embodied procedural fashion that's why things like tai chi chuan and yoga are important you need practices like i mentioned earlier like active open-mindedness or something like cbt where you're learning to look for all the cognitive biases in your inferential processing but you, but but you need something meta to that you need to you need a thing that says look at these practices they have complementary sets of functions complementary sets of strengths and weaknesses you need to constellate them together in a reflective and empirically validated manner so that they self-correct so that their strengths and weaknesses are set together right in a complementary fashion that's what i mean when i talk about an ecology of practices you have to have an ecology of practices that commit us to a process a process like we talked about of overcoming um, self-deception and and affording uh, self-transcendence wisdom but they have to they don't right that set of abilities to respond to the perennial problems has to be integrated with the best work in cognitive science that gives us a new way right not 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 a nostalgic i want to go before before the scientific revolution forget that that's not going to happen right you can't unwind the history so but why i'm enth so enthusiastic of the work by people like evan thompson and uh, barella Lowlands, my, all the people that are what are, what are called 4E or third generation cog sci, is that this is a cognitive scientific endeavor that is trying to basically give us a, a scientifically legitimate alternative worldview in which we belong, in which cognition is inherently embodied, mm -hmm. it's inherently embedded, it's inherently inactive, right? It's inherently extended and emotion and uh, and cognition are inseparably sewn together. And believe me, there is a lot of terrifically good and increasingly convergent cognitive science, cognitive psychology, neuroscience, dynamical systems theory thinking, all pointing towards this worldview. And so we need that in order to respond. That's what I would argue. Yeah. That's why I'm doing. That's why I'm doing the two parts of the series. Mm -hmm. The history deals with, you know, how can we. How can we understand our worldview, cognitive, cultural, grammar? How can we come up with an alternative one? And then how can we mesh that in a reciprocally, you know, affording fashion with an ecology of practices? Yeah, that's uh, really interesting. It actually reminds me of something that Ken Wilber quite often talks about is the ascending and descending arrow of consciousness, where ascending is like you could say it's up. So you're trying to remove yourself from everything and kind of observe it impartially. And then descending yes. is when you try to embody it fully and actually yes. be in it and practice in it. Yes, yes. So you, you need both. Uh, and, and that's part of also that overlaps with what I was talking about meditation and contemplation. You need the zoom out and the zoom in. Um, in fact, it's really interesting because as, as I'm going through the uh, cohering the we, the we space anthology about the authentic discourse um, uh, practices, right? They invoke, without knowing, uh, I think, I mean, they might know the Wilbur, so maybe that's an influence, but they talk a lot about how important, um, you know, getting zoom in, zoom out is uh, to make sure, making sure that you're constantly uh, making uh, the process unfold, you're, you're, affo you're affording it. Now, what that is converging with, for example, here's what I mean about converging with the science. I do a lot of work on insight problem solving. What is it to have an insight? Right. And what the research is converging on, I would argue, and I've argued it, right, is that, you know, you know, you need processes that sort of, you know, like meditation, they, 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 they get you to step back and you, you, you sort of pull apart your frame. Right. But you also need processes that allow you to leap. It's often it's right to leap to the new way of seeing. And, and if you have both of those, you will tend to improve your capacity uh, for getting an insight when you need it. And so the science, uh, I think, is lining up very much with a lot of these ideas. Uh, now, again, I'm not just, oh, I'm not an apologist. The science, and I've just shown you, also criticizes a lot of ways in which people have tried to adopt these, right? I just gave you a criticism of a lot of the way in which the West is adopting 
you know, uh, you know, uh, mindfulness, or you know, I, I forget the name. Of, I, I want to order his book. He calls it McMindfulness. Yeah. Uh, right. Yes. <laughs> right. right? Um, <laughs> and so the science also, you know, what we need is we need, you know, that these have to be in a genuine dialogue, right? I'm not just an apologist saying, oh, the science supports this traditional worldview. Mm. Uh, apologetics and a nostalgia is something I'm deeply suspicious of as a solution. Um, also utopic, oh, just follow me and there, here's the permanent perpetual future. I'm also deeply uh, suspicious of that. But as long as there's a reciprocal reconstruction between the science and the ecology of practices, I think we're, in, we're, we're on a good course. Are you familiar with the work of Shinzen Young? I met him. Um, I met him. Um, I had a really interesting uh, interaction with him. Uh, um, uh, so he, he we, uh, we only met once uh, and it was at, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I forget his name. It was a, a former student of mine and he sort of said, I want you two to meet. And so we met and we talked. It was very interesting because he, <laughs> I don't know how to say this. Um, I was trying to I was trying to talk to him, and, and it, it became it became much more of a dialogue because originally I thought it would be me just sort of asking questions and getting answers from. But he kept saying that a lot of the dialogue, a lot of the vocabulary I was using, he was finding it very perspicacious and very helpful for trying to articulate what he was saying. Um, now that's only an end of one. That's only one person, but there aren't a lot of people, on the other hand, who claim to be enlightened. So getting a large number of uh, participants for that uh, investigation is difficult. But it, 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 I came away from that, um, and, and not to put too much on it, and I try not to, but I came away from that sort of encouraged that there seemed to be a genuine, and this happened over you know about a, an hour or more of conversation, a genuine resonance. Um, I'm not claiming to be enlightened. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is there seemed to be a resonance between this framework I'm trying to articulate for you guys and um, his own search for a vocabulary, a conceptual vocabulary for articulating some of what he was talking about. Mm. The reason why I brought him up is because the zooming in and zooming out in those exact terms is one of his very core practices. Like yeah, and, and 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 like I say, I do not think that's a coincidence. So if you read again, if you read the paper that Leo and I published on reformulating the mindfulness construct, we don't do it from tradition, though. We do it from here's what the science shows you, right? And and, and so we're very careful about that because we've got lots of people offering uh, the traditional argument, uh, but we say no, no, no. You know, in the, so people who are not investigating mindfulness at all, people who are just trying to figure out how to improve problem solving, how to make us more insightful, more creative, they are independently coming to this machinery as the machinery for facilitating this. And then I should let you know that we've been trying to develop that work. Uh, 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 Leo Ferraro and Aria uh, Hera Bennett and I just published uh, 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 an article in the Oxford Handbook of Spontaneous Thought, arguing that the flow state is just a higher, is a more extended. It's a, it's what we call an insight cascade. It's a bunch of insights uh, cascading, like one insight priming and making. So you're getting sort of a, an extended aha, and that's what's going on. Um, and we've got sort of arguments and evidence for that in the um, in the flow state. And then um, the experiment I mentioned earlier uh, about mystical experiences seems to be. It's it's got it provides evidence suggesting that. It's not the content of the mystical experience. It's more the insight-like aspect. So it's not just an ins. See, mystical experiences aren't an insight in consciousness. There's an insight of consciousness, right? Yes. It's a, It's not a restructuring of a problem in your consciousness. It's a. It's a. It's a systematic insight. It's a restructuring of your whole consciousness um, and cognition. And so that's even higher. So I'm uh, working with Daniel Craig and Madeline Ibramian on a book right now. Uh, it's should be done this year, uh, called the cognitive uh, continuum from insight to enlightenment, trying to pick up on all of the, that. There's all this that there's a continuum. You're, we're basically using the same machinery, but in more and more. Maybe that's part of Wilbur's spiral. I don't know. A spiral suggests to me that there's something the same is being preserved, even though there's an increase in an exaptation. And so, what seems I would be arguing, maybe this is convergent. I, I need to talk to him, right? Is that what you're what you're seeing is an exaptation of the insight machinery. So, exaptation is an evolutionary process where you take something that evolved for one function and then you can use it for another function. 
This evolved for tasting poison and moving food around, but it's been exacted for speech. Mm -hmm. I use it for speech that, because many organisms have tongues that don't speak. But because it has all of these nerves for tasting poison, because it has to be really flexible uh, for moving my food around, and because it happens to be in the air passageway, it's a significant, I mean, it's not the sole thing. I need a larynx and other things. But evolution doesn't have to create this articulatory machine from scratch. It's got one ready to go. And so it just exaps that into. And I think the insight machinery, right, is being exacted, right, into flow, into mystical experience, into awakening experiences. These are mystical experiences that cause people to do that tremendous transformation that we talked about. And, and, and then when, when you get that transformation coupled to a sapiential developmental process of trying to overcome self-deception comprehensively and uh, afford self-transcendence so that you can systematically in, in an, in comprehensively address the perennial problems. I think that's what it is to become an enlightened person. And again, that's not a final state. It's to be, it's to have, a, it, have it has to have emerged into a particular course of development. So I would like to talk to uh, Ken about that because it just, I mean, I just sort of had that thought now. I don't know if it's right, but it, the metaphor of a spiral suggests to me, right? Something like acceptation is occurring. Yeah. And so that, that sounds that's really interesting. Yeah. Oh, well, well good. Wow. That's great. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's really good. <laughs> yeah, I think that's, I think he's talked specifically about that in one or two YouTube videos. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. It would actually be very interesting to facilitate a, a dialogue between you and Ken and also you and Shinzen. That would be super interesting. Yeah. Like I said, I met him once before, and I I, I, I found it a really interesting, uh, Shinzen, a really interesting interaction. Um, so I, I'd be happy to do uh, I'd be happy to do that. And and you guys have really, I mean, I already had the interest uh, because of, of Peter, uh, Peter Lindbergh, and the, some of the stuff I'm reading, and also uh, indirectly because of the interaction with Jordan. But I'd be, be really interested. And also Dave, Dave Fuller from uh, Rebel Wisdom, yes. uh, talking with Ken Wilber at some time. Uh, I, I, I think that would be, I, I, I would find it, I think, beneficial. I hope he would, uh, he would too. So. Mm -hmm. All right. That was part one of our interview with John Verveke. Check out his lecture series, Awakening from the Meaning Crisis, on YouTube. You can find all the links and show notes to this episode at futurethinkers.org slash 98. Part two of this interview goes live in a week and we'll dive deeper into strategies for self-transformation and creating meaning. And if you want to stay up to date with our latest episodes, blog posts, or news from Future Thinkers, join our mailing list at futurethinkers.org slash mailing list. To meet like-minded people, join our Future Thinkers Discord community. Go to futurethinkers.org slash discord. Check out our new course in Personal Evolution. Part one is on cultivating sovereignty and is designed to support you in developing more clarity about your direction and purpose in life, making better decisions, and having more agency to live your life on your own terms. Part two is on integrating the shadow and is designed to support you in overcoming nihilism and tapping into an inner source of energy, creativity, and wisdom to make meaningful progress towards actualizing your full potential. To learn more, go to courses.futurethinkers.org. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell icon to get notified of new videos. You can also follow us on social media to stay connected. If you'd like to get a t-shirt like the new Make America Think Again, go to futurethinkers.org slash store. If you like what we do and you want to help us make more podcasts and videos, consider donating or becoming a patron at futurethinkers.org slash support. Also visit our sponsor Qualia and use the coupon code FUTURE to get 10% off your purchase. 